Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, I have a fellow addiction recovery coach on the show with me. Her name is Sophie Agdami. Sophie, how are you today? I'm very well. Thank you, Matt. How are you doing? I am very great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, you know, I was excited to do this with you. We had uh, felt like we had a really good uh, connection just through text messages through Instagram. Uh, you know, you can get a fairly good vibe for people just through uh, through in- interactions that way. I was really drawn to you, and I don't know if you recall this, but really drawn to the uh, the theme that you have, the whole the world, the wolf you feed, and we talked a little bit about that. So that as soon as I saw that, I'm like, ooh, I like this. Per- I'm going to reach out to this person for sure. So. Um, I want to get a little bit into that, you know, uh, how that shows up for you and like your program. I imagine that's a bit of a theme. Um, and, you know, I always like to just start off with like present day. So what do you have going on as far as uh, your addiction recovery coach practice? How has it been going? Yeah, just a little bit about what you have going on right now, Sophie. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me on. And like you said, you know, I also uh, enjoyed our connection and it, I always find Instagram and all these platforms, such an amazing way to connect with other people doing this meaningful work. So I really appreciate you reaching out. And um, and yeah, as you mentioned, the name is is often something that uh, people, you know, get their eye caught by, the wolf you feed. Um, actually, I could probably start with just talking about that parable briefly, just in case they're familiar yeah. if they're hearing it. Um, so the wolf you feed uh, is based on a parable um, about um, a little boy who is talking with his grandfather and his grandfather says, there's uh, a fight going on inside of me and it's going on inside of all of us. And it's between two wolves. One is dark, one's the dark wolf and he is shame anger, grief, those sorts of things. And the other wolf is the light wolf and he is compassion and love and all of those sorts of things. And the little boy says, well, which one wins? And the grandfather says, the one you feed. And so that for me um, really spoke to me when it comes to my own recovery journey, but also moving forward as a coach, you know, it's all about which wolf that we feed um, life generally, but also especially in recovery. So that's a little story to the name. Yeah. um, Beautiful, beautiful. I'm glad that you did that. Yeah, just for the folks that uh, perhaps have not heard that one. I'm glad that you cleared that. I I swear I get goosebumps every time I hear somebody's iteration of that. And it is such a, it's such a powerful, uh, you know, story, isn't it? I love it. I love it. It really is. And, you know, that sort of leads in then to that present moment of what's happening with my coaching. I have um, have a number of coaches at the moment. So um, because of COVID, many of those are online. Um, but we work predominantly with that model of which wolf do you feed? And it's a really powerful model um, to use in recovery because, even though we tend to uh, move towards focusing on how we can feed the light wolf, that good wolf, um, it's also really important to honor the dark wolf inside of us as well and not necessarily feed it and let it take over, but really honor what it stands for. You know, anger isn't necessarily a bad thing because depending on how we use it, that helps us create boundaries, you know, Shame is not a bad thing. It gives us bad, you know, it gives us very difficult things to deal with. But if we push shame down, mm. it then exacerbates it and makes it stronger. So it, it's really about really honoring that side, but certainly feeding the light wolf, you know. Yeah. So that's where I'm at today, working with clients um one-to-one and also planning some uh more group sessions, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Yes, that'll be the coming soon. I love that little foreshadowing for what we can talk about <laughs> later. Excellent. Well, I'm really happy. How long uh, are you into your coaching journey? That'll be a, my first follow-up question. Yeah, so that has been a, a sort of three-year um, journey, uh, more so the last two years, simply because there are other projects going on and things like that. And I was really inspired to get into this work Um mainly because I was so impacted by a recovery coach on my own journey. And I had a sort of dip into it very early 
on in my journey uh, in the sense that, well, as part of my journey, I was encouraged to help others. So I was uh, part of some uh, recovery coaching programs over in Bali, which is where I was doing a lot of my personal recovery. Okay. And I was blown away by how helping others and being of service to others in this world was yeah. so powerful for them and myself as well. So I'd had this little dip into that world and then you know, life takes over and things got busy with other work. And then I really thought, you know, that is my life's purpose. It's really to get back mm. into work. And that's when I then did my training and then, um, you know, sort of got into it from there and yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. That's so cool. And what were you doing beforehand? And how hard was it to just go, okay, realize because there's a lot of people, you know, myself included, I did a little bit of overlap where it was kind of felt like these, these two worlds, right? It was like the old version of me. And then I'm trying to like have this overlap of like this new thing that coaching that I'm doing. And eventually there was just, it hit a, 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 a specific moment where I was like, okay, I'm going straight, like full-time coaching. This is what I, I meant to do. What was your story like that? Did it show up like that? Was there some overlap? Was it a gradual sort of dissolving of the old view or, you know, however you want to word it of the old uh, profession that you were in before? Uh, what did that look like for you? So there hasn't been a sort of clean swap for me. I still work, uh, I've got a branding uh, agency as well. So I do a lot of branding and strategy, brand strategy work. Um, but that was the predominant thing that I was doing. And I was working for a different agency. So in terms of a change, there's been quite a large one in the sense that now all of my work is for myself. Ah. Um, but I was previously, so I did do a leap. Uh, yeah, into yeah, the, yeah. the big abyss of the unknown but it right. was really safe. and then as this work um sort of you know picks up more and more it's certainly taking up a bigger percentage which I'm delighted by um another aspect of my coaching is actually that um I've got a business partner we, we've got a separate business to the Wolfie Feed which is called From Here On and we work with uh, rehabs to provide aftercare programs mm -hmm. and also with uh, coaches or people in recovery you know normally people that have been in recovery a little bit longer or they've just finished rehab and they want to continue their journey of health and wellness we provide them with programs sort of aftercare programs so there's sort of lots of different things yeah. going on and apart from the branding work, most of this, you know, it's all in the recovery space and that is yeah. growing more and more. So, you know, yeah. there's a lot going on, but that, that space is certainly taking over, which is great. That is great. Yes. Yeah. Um, I imagine that the, uh, like the branding and such has also come in handy, right? It's as far as just having that eye for, and it's definitely apparent on your Instagram you know, channel or Thank page you. that you have. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, and we'll have that in the show notes, of course, just very clean design, the branding colors and such. You can tell that there's been some thought put into it. So I imagine that there is like, was it the Venn diagram? Are there some like overlap? It's not entirely in the recovery field, but there's like, it definitely strengthens what you're doing in the recovery field, correct? Absolutely. And, you know, when it comes to the branding work that I do, it's, it's brand strategy. And, you know, strategy is actually... Uh, what I believe is very much one of the foundation stones of recovery as well. You know, we need oh. strategy to yeah, sure. our way forward and yeah. keep going forward in life. So yeah. that kind of mindset has certainly played a huge role in that approach with coaching as well. Very cool. I love it. It seems a very art. Uh, you have like an artist's creative, like that right brain. I can, I, I, I'm imagining it as a big part of your life. Like, yeah, that kind of artist uh, approach to life. It seems, you know, so yeah. it's very cool, very cool. Um, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's yeah. interesting because you've got the sort of strategic side, which is more of that cognitive side, and yeah. then I also teach yoga, and, and and so there's kind of this creative side and this part of you know a, a strong spirit spiritual side as well right so right I really hope that all of that comes together comes and, together and yeah create this coaching model that's you know fairly yeah. unique and really can help people in that sense as well yeah absolutely and you know I'm finding uh with the variance of 
both the coaching practices and the way that people recover nowadays. Like I, I always, I'll always say I have one foot in like in 12 step. Cause that was a huge, that saved my life. Right. Uh, the, then I reached a point where I needed and wanted more and was desiring more. Like I have I very much have a lifelong learner and growth mindset. So that's when I started getting into like breath work and yoga and, you know, hitting the gym and doing different, uh, you know, different workouts I would have normally done and all these other different things. And I'm finding that that's what is showing up in people's recovery as well. There's a desire to uh, explore many different modalities of recovery. And it can be very nuanced and customizable depending on the person. There isn't necessarily a one size fits all, which, you know, to a degree, there is some rigidity with the 12 step program uh, that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily allow for that. Right. So uh, are you finding that as well? Like with, with uh, the folks that you're coaching um, there might be some common themes, but there's also some very much some nuances in the way that people are, are recovering as well. Absolutely. And I really feel strongly that it's, uh, it always just comes back to that mind, body, spirit connection. You know, during my um, battle uh, with addiction, you know, when I was sort of in the depths of it, I tried often to focus just on one of those things, you know, so I would mm. really intellectualize what addiction was and it was just podcast after podcast after podcast yeah, yeah. and I was yeah. completely disconnected from my spirit and my body yeah. and then I thought okay I'll just go deep into my yoga practice and then all of that went out the window the cognitive stuff and so it was imbalanced again so mm. I to learn myself and then share what's worked which is essentially this connection between mind body and spirit yeah. is really where I found peace in finding recovery and also that's where I then try and share that message with others as well to really find that balance yeah in what we do because like you mentioned 12 step is very you know has certainly has its place I also saved yeah. my life as, as it's yeah. yours there's also parts of it then I feel were missing for me so you know it's really yeah. such a unique and individual journey for each of us but I think that if we can all focus on at least parts of those three mm. sort of trilogy if you like yes yes find some balance there yeah that's that's wonderful i that very much of the same way um yeah with that balance of the the three for sure the trilogy i like that well <laughs> you alluded to uh to it a couple of times there's been a little bit of uh um you know nuggets if you will of your own recovery story so i want to give you some an opportunity we'll do a little bit of origin story origin story with yourself and and with uh whatever your uh you know, pick your poison was like growing up and, you know, like this, what, however far back you care to go uh, and uh, as open as you, as you want to be, the floor is yours. I'd love to hear your personal recovery journey and, uh, and how that all played out for you. Yeah, for sure. So um, for me, uh, I didn't find myself in that abyss straight away. You know, um, I know, you know, we've all got a different way that we sort of arrive in, in the depths. Um, mine felt uh, like quite a slow progression. Um, so I, I grew up in Switzerland um, until I was about 12 and, and, you know, childhood was great. You know, we lived pretty much outdoors and mm. we had so much fun and it's a super healthy uh, country to live in. So alcohol was never one of those things that was deeply present in life uh in my family you know it was a very healthy part to to the degree of maybe you know I'd see a parent have a glass of wine or something like that but there was no alcoholism or anything um that I was privy to early on but then uh when we moved to England and you might be aware of the drinking culture in England um yes. <laughs> you know it, <laughs> yeah. it to start fairly early on and of right. course then in secondary school it was a very normal thing to uh, you know, have a few drinks, uh, at which you know, point, I mean, pretty much a lightweight at that age I was anyway. And so it wasn't much volume <laughs> at that time. Sure, sure. And um, it was very much uh, part of being sociable. You know, I love being a social, I loved being a social butterfly and sort of, you know, that really helped just, you know, loosen, loosen things up and it was yeah. fun. Um, and so I did that sort of when I started having a relationship with alcohol and that did certainly grow quite exponentially when I started working. Um, I, I, I did some part-time work in a pub 
from you know mm. in my teens okay. and that obviously normalized things very quickly because um yeah everyone's drinking and so uh i then decided i did a marketing degree but alongside i was working in restaurants i really loved the food industry it was a, a deep passion of mine and food still is um and i actually decided after you need to get into the restaurant industry and in england you often will get restaurants that are more like gastro pubs you know so they're attached to a pub uh, yeah. So that's when uh, things rapidly unraveled for me because, um, you know, it, it was only a couple of years ago I really reflected on this where by when people are coming in, you know, you're seeing just this whole stream of people coming in and drinking. And so drinking all the time becomes very normal. But what is different is that those people are just coming in once a week for a drink whereas right. you're okay. drinking yeah. solidly while you're open mm. right so um things you know it started off uh with drinking in the evening after a shift or something because the hours were incredibly long so it was an association to winding down but then those nights would become quite full-on with drinking and slowly over the daytime it would be a sort of like at lunchtime actually that have, have a hair of, a, of the dog Sure. And then, of course, with time, that crept into the morning. And so, naturally, it's not a very uh, normal or usual way of living. So that became a bit of a secret pattern of mine because it's not particularly appropriate to be drinking early on in the day um, at work. <laughs> yeah. And um, when I realised, you know, this went on for a couple, of, a couple of years and I noticed it was incredibly unhealthy and I was absolutely burnt out. The irony being that I thought it was the hours and not quite connecting the dots ah, with it being the excessive drinking. Of course. Um, I got out of that industry. Um, and unfortunately, by that point, it had taken hold. So, um, and it showed itself in a much more obvious way because I was doing more of a nine to five corporate job. Mm -hmm. So when you're in that industry, you know, it's quite apparent that those drinking habits are highly uh unhealthy yeah what happened though was I couldn't stop you know I, I tipped over that edge and um, there was too much association by that point for me with certain emotions so anxiety relaxation or whatever the emotion I associated all of them to mm. being necessary whether it was to wind down or lessen anxiety or all of those sorts of things and so the secret part of the drinking as well as the more social side of the drinking increased more and more and with the secret drinking obviously there was a lot of shame that came with that so that then exacerbated that more you know so it was a huge kind of downhill yeah. um you know very very fast downhill yeah. run Yes. Um, run and stumble probably more often than just run <laughs> um, it, it all came to a head um, in my late 20s uh, when a family member reached out to me in a way that others hadn't there was a lot of compassion mm. in, and a lot of non-judgment in the way that he approached me and I'm deeply deeply grateful to him for that approach because it lessen the shame just enough to mm. open a window of opportunity for me to be open to go to rehab yeah. and and that so that's what happened I, I went to rehab in Thailand uh, for mm. five weeks which okay. was quite an, an amazing experience you know a lot yeah. came up there in terms of um, why I was drinking as well as giving me that necessary break from it and um and actually in an environmental change you know being plucked mm. out of where I was was hugely powerful for me um what was tricky at that point and this is potentially uh why myself and my business partner have gone into this aftercare model for rehabs is that that wasn't there unfortunately in a very strong way when I left and so although it had been great to leave um initially leave my environment when I went back to it I just you know it was a huge struggle to then stay on top of recovery because there was memories there were triggers there was all of that sort of stuff so 
I did have a period of time where uh, I dipped in and out of recovery and addiction. Um, but something had changed by this point because I'd done that work at rehab. So there was more awareness in what was happening rather than just going full throttle and drinking and not understanding why I was. And mm. those sort of, so the awareness had been switched on and awareness is actually something that, you know, in my coaching practice is, is very central to how we work because awareness of where we want to go, but also where we're at and where we've been is, is so key. Mm. Um, so I had the awareness, so I kept trying. Um, and then an opportunity came up uh, to go to Bali, which is a sort of second home for, for me. Uh, I live in Australia at the moment, so it's much easier to get there from here than Europe. <laughs> but, um, yeah. An opportunity came up for me to work, to go over there and, and do a, a bit of yoga training. But also I was thinking, you know, I have to be honest with myself. I need to spend some time on my recovery. Um, so I actually put that first. I gave up my job. I was in a, a sort of great place where I had the opportunity to do that. Mm. I went there and that was the beginning of a, a different type of journey. And, and as we were talking earlier about that spirit, that spiritual side, yeah. Bali is an, incre an incredibly spiritual island. I've heard that. I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the island of the gods, as it's mm. called. Um and that allowed me to uh, get very much into my spirit, but then also work cognitively, you know, with a recovery coach uh, over there. And it was, yeah, it was life changing for me. Um, and after that, that was the longest stint. That was actually a few months where I was, you know, really focusing on recovery and putting yeah. it first. Um, and that's actually where AA was a huge help. For me as well and mm. um, my previous experiences with, with rehab uh, with AA were probably not the best you know walking into a room with um three uh much older men you know in a in a sort of sports hall with dingy lighting you know <laughs> there, was, there was just nothing there whereas yeah. in Bali, I went <laughs> with, um, this women's meeting in Bali which was incredibly powerful for uh, me um, sure and so, you know, as we were talking about earlier, it certainly had a huge place in my recovery as well. And I still obviously pull from it as well now. You know, the 12 steps are an amazing system. It is. Um, yeah, 100%. So, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. So, so after that, um, I, I had realized that recovery has to come first no matter what. And that is my sort of my way of being now as well you know a few years on it's just very much what drives my life and my health um yeah. and it's it's my primary focus so I have you know spiritual practices in the morning a morning routine which I got I imagine you have um yeah. in yours too yes um, and being of service to others you know working in this space uh and also uh focusing on my wolves you know, that yeah. they're all sort of part, part of where I'm at now. After yeah. That. Beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I just love hearing, you know, people's stories. There's always elements that we can hear in each other's stories. And then there's always like points of inspiration. And yeah, that really did save my life was hearing other people's stories in that first, you know, AA meeting that I had gone to is just my my desire for like ego or persona just melted away. And, and I was just like a raw you know, version of, you know, who I truly am. And it just like, yeah, that first meeting definitely saved my life. So yeah, so much going on in, in your, uh, in your recovery story there. It's, it's so cool. And then, so you're, um, a couple of years in by the sounds of it, or is that, is it. I went to rehab, um, gosh, rehab was seven, almost seven years ago. Congratulations. Had, wow. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. And obviously I did have that period of. Yeah. Sort you of mentioned that. Rehab. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what's interesting, Matt, and I, I speak about this a lot with my clients. Um, for me, the celebration, you know, in AA and, and other models, there the can be a lot of focus on the first sort of dry date, which obviously yeah. has, um, it has its pluses. Yeah. But I also have noticed in my own journey and also in others, if there's a relapse, there can be a lot of shame 
Mm. Yeah. starting again at day one yeah. so my, my personal celebration and also the one that you know I encourage others to celebrate is really that first day that we decided to get into recovery I because love that. That, yeah that's yeah. really where the work that. starts yeah. you know yeah. and even though I had you know a couple of years after that of kind of dipping in yeah. and out of trying different things and trying addiction again yeah right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that real celebration is the courage that it took yeah. to go, I'm going to go and, and make a change here. So, I, yeah. I really, yeah. So, you know, you're the first person that's had that perspective on that. Cause then, you know, I like, I'll quickly share, I mean, we're interviewing you here, but I quickly share uh, mine. I had like a, a similar thing. I took five weeks off uh, in 2012. And the first two weeks of that was this huge bender. And then finally I, uh, I went to my first AA meeting. A friend of mine uh, took me to it and that's what straightened me up. And it was three, little over three years that I was sober. And then I, I did relapse and it was a little bit lengthier by the sounds of it than yours. It was closer to probably three and a half or four years of just mo trying moderation and my ego really wanting to prove that I could be that one person that was like, yeah. you know, the alcohol problem drinker. And I can, I've corrected it. I've done enough, per, you know, personal work that I, I can and like what you were talking about earlier, like uh, in, intellectualize it and, and, you know, 0% success rate. I tried everything, you know, trying different drinks, trying, you know, only drinking on the weekends, trying only drinking when I go out, trying having the drinks in the garage, which is detached from the house, try, you know, everything and, and none of it worked. And then, so I'm coming up on four years now. So I think it's very refreshing that you look at that. Cause I do have like a pretty substantial big chunks of time and then there was that that area in between where so I, I yeah I really I I I like I appreciate what you're saying about the you know, that first sober day which would have been back in 2012 and it's been big one big continuum of recovery essentially with some um allowance or allowing for that experimentation and uh you know at the end of the day I, I came out the other side and and continue to live you know alcohol free now so I love that. I love your take on that. It's really cool. Yeah. And it's, and I loved hearing your story, you know, as well. So thanks for sharing because it's, it is all growth. All right. the whole journey is growth, you know, yeah. whether it's a little bit here or there, it doesn't then mean that the, the two years prior have been wiped out. You know, you were right. growing through that and actually um, mm. talking with a client actually last week about how it's all about, you know, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. And, you know, you're always finding we're always finding the next piece until it's complete totally. and so if we have a relapse it's not like we just sh you know push right, the right. Puzzle off the table yeah exactly yeah. start <laughs> again yeah that's a good point that's a good point the i love that you know another analogy that i uh used on somebody we were riffing about it on a different podcast and it was like uh, a sports analogy, more, perhaps more of a guy's analogy, but uh, you know, like if a sports team has like 30 wins in a row and then they lose a game, you're not going to be like, oh, you such a loser, you know, like how we do to ourselves, right? You're going to be like, man, you won 30 games in a row. Like, that's amazing. Like the focus is going to be on that. And then it's going to be, okay, what are they going to, what's the next winning streak going to be like, right? They're not going to harp on, I mean, maybe some like, you know, negative Nellies, uh, uh, you know, that, that seemingly like that kind of, but generally speaking, you're going to focus on the the one. And again, it's so cool that it's like the, the one you feed, right? So it yeah. kind of, to tie it back to that theme but yeah that's really cool i love that i love that sports yeah. analogy as well yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice nice you know we're, we're trading in uh you know analogies exactly. are, they're so powerful though right as soon as you can frame it a certain way to yourself or and then to a client or just anybody like you're talking the service aspect you know that, that can really stick with people right like information is information but if you can attach a story or an analogy to it you can just see that light bulb moment go off in somebody can't you Absolutely. And it's actually, um, it's a little bit like, uh, and this is funny because this comes from, uh, this is an analogy from the branding work I do, uh, but it applies to recovery in which we can't always read the label if we're inside of the jar. Oh, I love that one too. Yeah. And yeah. so sometimes if we're always personalizing everything, we can't really see out. We're just personalizing and then all the emotions come in and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, so if we can speak to ourselves or clients or, you know, whomever in a way that says that this is a story about someone else or this is a parable, or this is an analogy, 
yeah. it takes us out of our own jar, you right, know, which right. we can actually see it in a different way without yeah. just being inwardly. And it comes back to, you know, the wolves, you know, it, it helps us build more self-compassion, a bit like the um, that saying about, you know, speak to your friend, speak to yourself like you would a best friend. You know, it's similar, really, when we get the analogies in there. Yeah. So would you really say that to your best friend, even though you're saying right. it to yourself or even a stranger? Yeah. And most people say, no, I wouldn't. You know, right. so it's about pulling ourselves out sometimes and just remembering those things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a great way of looking at it, too. Yeah, a few things I was jotting it down as we're going, you know, that aftercare thing is so important. And I think that's where, you know, uh, you know, folks like us that can provide that that service. It's like, I, I look in, uh, you know, I've not, I hadn't done the, like a rehab programs, but so correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I imagine it to be a little bit like, it's like they call it the sauna effect, right? While you're in there, everything's sort of planned for you. It's like, you know, you have that temperate climate, if you will. And then by the time you get out of there, it's like, okay, like you'd mentioned, like the, the, those, these cues, these visual cues are there. There's people that are going to trigger certain things in you. Like there's, yes, you did an, 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 you know, an amazing amount of work in 28 days or 30 days or 60 days or however long you're in there for, but yeah, you're still coming out that other side. And, uh, you know, there's only so much that you can repair. Say if it's a pattern that you've been, you know, running subconsciously since childhood, which let's face it, there's a lot of those, uh, mm -hmm. it's not going to correct itself in, in, in 60 days. There is going to be some physicality. There is the bo body mind relationship, right? And you may have may process it up here, but it's still going to be stored in your body. Right. So I think aftercare is so important for so important, you know, can, and it cannot be overlooked as far as part of the recovery process. And it sounds like it was a big part of your story to the point that you're in fact, you know, engaging in that nowadays, that's a big part of like what you're providing, uh, you know, um, in, in, in your service and you're giving back essentially. So yeah, I just, I guess more of a, a topic, I didn't really have a question ready for it, but yeah. Okay. Well, here's the question. What's the importance of, of aftercare? In your yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, for all those things that you just mentioned, it, it's hugely important. You know, if we, like, I love the sauna effect, you know, I, I, the one I was, was always imagining when I when I left rehab was that I was almost in this kind of cushioned cloud, you know, mm. a nice warm cloud that yeah. was sure. and then kind of just, you know, dropped off at the airport and it's kind of like, <laughs> you're on your own now. Yeah, yeah. Just, um, yeah. And so and you know, so things like stepping back into a home where, you know, I mean for me, for example, being a secret drinker, you know, I would walk home and I'd see a cupboard and I'd go, oh my God, that's where I used to stash mm. empty bottles or full bottles or, oh, yeah. you know, environmentally, there's a lot of cues and it's important to work through those and, and have some support, you know, when you're doing that. Also, accountability is key to continue that on because we get a lot of strength through honesty and, and accountability. So having someone or a group of, you know, a, a team to be checking in with and doing things with, is important another thing is that you know when we when we go off to rehab um it's not quite necessarily that we come out this sort of new shiny coin but there are certainly changes that happen the diff the, the, the challenge is that when we get home unless the family has been part of that process those changes haven't happened in the family system so we right. get back into the family system and in that family system we're still seen as the addict and everyone else has their roles in that system. And when we come back, not as the addict, it causes a lot of disarray in that family system unconsciously. You know, people obviously family con in their conscious part of their mind are thinking we want this person to come back well. Mm. But in an unconscious part, their role in the family system goes into disarray and mm. so coming back into to to a place where you know conversations might be coming at us in the same way as they were you know all of those sorts of things play a huge part in those risks building in us then relapsing you know so yeah. with the, so with those programs that that we create we we actually do bring we encourage uh, obviously don't force it but we encourage work with the family you know the key loved ones or family members yeah. as well so that <clears throat> excuse me so that you know it's a really holistic approach to not just the person but the persons that they are also around 
you know yeah, super um, smart inc- including you know if someone's got a very good relationship with their boss or something and they're they've been open about going to rehab bringing them in as well so those conversations can be had so that that person also understands from the person in recovery what their triggers are with work where their pressure mm. tipping is all of those sorts of things so everyone can work together in yeah. that system to create that long-term recovery rather than that one person coming out of this you know environment where they had a team around them supporting their recovery right going home and then just trying to bulldoze through it on their own yes you know yeah. so, yeah. so that's why you know that that aftercare is so important yeah, super smart. And I, I I imagine, especially when you're bringing like certain family members, but especially like a boss into something like that, where it's like, if they aren't super familiar with dealing with somebody that has gone through that, there's a degree of like, you know, just uh, hesitation or uncomfortability for that person. And as soon as you can bring that in with like, hey, like it's been addressed and normalized and like let's just have the conversations i imagine that's like super empowering for all all parties and just takes that like you know potential hesitation or awkwardity just removes it all together it's just like hey like this is what it is let's normalize it let's have a conversation about it and uh you know and it's such a higher rate of success at that stage i would imagine absolutely and you know sh- unfortunately with addiction it's it's still the, the shame is still rife in the workplace and yeah. um you know Kylie my business partner and I are working really hard to try and get into these workplaces and do talks um called the elephant in the boardroom because Ooh, perfect. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah so good yeah. because really it is this elephant yeah. you know yeah. that everyone speaks about but everyone you know know well often we know it's happening or it gets pushed down and and so if we can remove the shame and and that's part of you know if the if it's safe for the 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 person in recovery to bring their boss in or you know people in culture team or something by reducing the shame it brings a lot of pride to their yes. recovery, you know right and, and yeah it's just the opposite of literally shame. yeah it's like the polar opposite in a lot of ways right it's like yeah 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 that was the way I was seeing powering, but yeah, that's, that's totally the word right there. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, I, I, I'm, I have this whole other topic I want to talk to you about. I think it'd be a brilliant way to do uh, like a part two. I'm, I'm not sure if you're interested in coming back on about it. Mm-hmm. Cause I know we're going to have to wrap it up here. This is a great way to just, you know, have some introductions, get to know you. I really enjoyed talking to you today, Sophie. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to you, and we'll have everything in the show notes here, but uh, what's the easiest way to get a hold of you? Um, so I'm on Instagram, so the underscore um, the uh, the underscore Wolfie yeah. Feed. Yes, <laughs> that one. My website <laughs> is um, thewolfiefeed.com. Okay, um, and there's lots of information on there, you know, and there's uh, yeah, there's some blog posts and things like that that people can can read up on. And um, yeah, Sophie at thewolfyfeed.com as well on email if people would like to contact me directly. Very cool. I am uh, impressed that you got thewolfyoufeed.com, by the way. that's I'm surprised <laughs> that was still available. Yeah. I mean, it's great that you got it. Yeah. <laughs> when I saw it was available, I was like, You're like click. I will be getting that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Beautiful website. I love the, the, again, the branding is very apparent, like the font. I'm I'm just like I'm getting into it myself, so like I I have an eye for it now, uh, and you I can tell you're you you you're on that obviously very very much a, a different level than me. So uh, very very good job there. I very much enjoyed this conversation. It went by that was already forty five minutes, and it went by like you know ten minutes. So um, yeah, I could talk about this stuff for hours. I imagine you can too. So yeah. And, um, yeah, you know what, let's leave it like that. I, I do have, uh, as soon as we, I'm eager to get off air with you. Cause I have a, an idea for this part two that I want to share with you. So Sophie, thank you again for coming on. And, uh, I really hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for having me, Matt. I'm look, looking forward to part two already. Awesome. <laughs>